have our panel. We have a trained fighter pilot from Morocco, who, however, turned to agronomics, then to genetics, before moving into, among other things, policymaking in Canada, and later became the chief scientist of the FAO, the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, as well as sitting on the advisory board of the UN Secretary General. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge applause to Ismahan Edwafi. This works. Isman, thank you very much for applauding yourself. This is, of course, very welcome. Welcome to the panel. Great to see you here. And we have somebody for whom the place of NGOs and civil society is absolutely crucial in the intergovernmental context. A political scientist serving as the senior science officer at the International Science Council based in Paris, Anne-Sophie Stevens. Anne-Sophie, bienvenue. And it really works. I'm so happy about this. <laughs> Moving on. Does everybody know what a Trekkie is? Please show me your hands if you do. Well, not all hands are up. So for those who don't know, it's the fans of the science fiction space exploring Star Trek series. You might remember Dr. Spock with the pointed ears. And the reason I'm mentioning the Trekkie part here is that there's hardly anything thing sitting so perfectly on the interface of science and storytelling as science fiction. And storytelling, after all, is communication. And communication certainly plays a center role in multilateral policymaking. So a Trekkie, but also a trained geographer, who puts, which puts him on the interface of social and natural sciences, but here in his function as policy offer, officer at the European Commission's International Cooperation Unit responsible for science diplomacy and multilateral relations, Jan Marco Müller. Jan Marco, ein ganz herzliches Willkommen and a huge applause. Olaf, you are muted. Olaf, you are muted. Still. We can't hear you. Yeah, yes, now. now I'm unmuted. But last but certainly not least, hailing from Australia, we have the player of the euphonium at the Nairobi Orchestra, the oldest symphonic orchestra in Africa, who in her day job is the chief scientist at the United Nations Environment Programme, based, as you all know, in the capital of Kenya. Huge applause to Andrea Hinwood. Andrea, welcome. Am I right to describe the euphonium as a brass instrument halfway between a trumpet and a tuba? It's probably an instrument halfway between a tuba and a trombone. So it's it's often called a tenor horn. Thank you very much for the for the correction. Now we have the enormous luxury of more than an hour of debating time. So I thought we can afford a little time to introduce everybody a little bit personally. And Andrea, as I just asked you, I would start, I'd like to start with you. You are a studied environmental epidemiologist. Could you say a few words about your path, how it led to the United Nations Environment Programme, and specifically, of course, how it led you to work on this interface of science and policy making? Thanks, Olaf. Actually, I've been really fortunate because I started out doing science, environmental science and applied toxicology, and then got a job in government dealing with uh, air pollution, contaminated sites, and of course, Montreal Protocol in terms of um, CFCs. And that then, I then ended up going and doing a PhD, and so is in academia. And then I went back to government again. So I've been one of these people that's kind of flitted between academia and government, which has meant I've always had to translate the science into policy. Why? Doing science is great and it's fun and all the rest of it, but at the end of the day, you want it to count and you want it to make a difference. And so really my journey is quite straightforward. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I, I mentioned the Nairobi Orchestra. Is there anything you take from this specific orchestra into your professional activities or are there any parallels? I think there are a couple of things about playing in an orchestra is that it takes every instrument of different types to actually come together to make beautiful music. 
And in many ways, it's what we're talking about when we've got the science policy interface, because we need multiple disciplines, multiple stakeholders, and we need to come together to actually come up with good policy that serves communities well. So for me, it's an analogy for collaboration, stakeholder engagement, and actually translating music so that people can understand it, same with science. Andrea, thank you very much. Jan Marco, when we spoke earlier, I thought this connection between geography and Star Trek is interesting because it's, it's, it's both about exploring or studying spaces, be it on Earth or be it in outer space. Now, I've thrown in this, this Trekkie element, of course, because there, there is a fun element to it, but or perhaps a few words on the event you organized in the European Parliament, which you told me about. <laughs> Well, yes, thank you, Olaf. Um, well, actually, it was um, about 10 years ago when I worked for, for the Chief Scientific Advisor and the European Commission, and uh, we both found out that both of us were Star Trek fans. And uh, there was also a group of uh, young members of the European Parliament uh, who were also into this. And then we thought, why not organize an event to uh, show how science fiction like Star Trek enthuses young people for science and technology and for going eventually into a career in that area. So we had an event there and uh, brought original cast members from the television series. We had the first European command of the International Space Station on the panel and, and a trainee astronaut talking about um, basically what the European Union does to make the 24th century happen. And the room was packed with 500 young people who probably otherwise would never have made their way into the European Parliament. Wonderful, Jan Marco. Taking this experience to our topic here, could storytelling for the promotion of science be something that could play a big role? Um, definitely, yes. Uh, because scientists have the problem they, that they kind of, you know, they are seen as the voice of reasons. We need to be cool. We need to speak to the brains. But, but actually, we also need to touch people's hearts um, to enthuse them and, and show empathy also for their concerns. And what, that's why storytelling is very important and narratives to bring the message across and to really touch people. Thank you very much. But, but you're also somebody who is on and off at the European Commission for almost 20 years, mostly on, actually. Could you say a few words on the motivations that have informed your path and how they led you to the work on this interface between science and policy making, which we're debating here? Um, yes, well, actually, uh, as you said, I have a PhD in geography, so I consider myself being both a natural and a social scientist, but I also always had my whole life an intricate interest in politics. And, and I developed my career at this interface because it was very important to me to make a, an impact in the real world with the science. And for this, you need to talk to the policymakers. And so I went into, you know, into science advisory positions, uh, including as a science advisor in the European External Action Service. And that's why I discovered, say, more and more the, the international, the global dimension um, to see how to, how to also bring the scientific evidence into uh, multilateral and intergovernmental bodies. Thank you. And Sophie, turning, turning to you, you told me about this, this vital importance of making place for the NGO perspective in international affairs and your work specifically on this in the interface of science and policy making. Could you say, say a few words on how this motivation has informed your professional path and how it informs what you are currently doing at the International Science Council? Thanks a lot, Olaf, and great to see everyone on, online. Um, so I started off 15 years ago um, working on the first French National Science um, Sustainable Development Strategy. Um, and at that time, it was about embedding sustainable development in each, in each ministry and then went on to, to work with local governments on energy and, and climate-related uh, issues. So I mostly started off working on um, with the policy policymakers at national and local level uh, before um, before joining the the IC um, and I was fortunate to join in 2012 um, at the time of the Rio plus 20 conference um, where the science community had organized um, a huge um, process to feed into into Rio plus 20 around um, planet under pressure bringing together all our knowledge on on global change and then seeing that through a few months later to negotiation on um, the future we want, 
was uh, was very inspiring and a, a thread about bringing expertise to bear in decision making around sustainable development. Oh, you're muted. Uh, yeah, I'm still unmuted. <laughs> this is really the beginner's error, and oh my god, it's happening all the time. Um, last but certainly not least, Ismahan, I guess that there is a story to be told here when somebody trains as a fighter pilot and a few decades later sits on the scientific advisory board of the UN Secretary General. So, Olaf, my my military time was in the high school. I went to a military high school to become a pilot fighter because it, it looked so cool at that time. I was just crazy about, I think, doing something different. I was a mathematician at that time, or I was very good in math during my high school. And I was going through competitions, national competitions. And then they came and said, if you're interested to do more in mathematics and even maybe do something different, come to this high school. And although my family are not a military, I went to the school against the will of my dad and mom. And uh, I started, but it never finished. It never came to be because the program itself was abolished once we finished high school. But I'm happy I am where I am, which is science and genetics. And how 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 did it lead you further to this interface of policy making and science? Actually, I got interested in the interface when I migrated to Canada. I migrated to Canada in 2004. I started working with McGill University because that was my word, academia and, and research. And I realized by moving to Canada that there are too many scientists and very few of them that would like to be in science management. So when I moved from McGill University to Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, I find that the government started a program called Scientists as Leaders because they realized that most of the science managers are, have either a finance background or low bank background. So these or financial. So it's the finance or, or the law, mainly. So they wanted people that know science. And that's where I got really interested. Once I got to work with the Assistant Deputy Minister of Research in Ag Canada, I just find it wonderful that the, the impact that you could have as science manager could be much, much higher than a scientist working on a particular virus or particular plant. And hence, I got really interested in science management. And they thought, since there is a need and since there is an opportunity, let's dive into it. And in science, once you move the side, it's so difficult to go back, particularly in certain areas like molecular biology that it's moving on a yearly basis. Once you are outside the research sphere, you lose your, your spot as a scientist. And hence, once I moved there three years later, I thought to myself, should I go back or continue? And I was too curious to find out how could I make more impact through managing science and true science policy interface. And they stayed. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess this point of how difficult it is for a researcher to stray a little bit out of the research career and come back later on will be another topic we'll, we will be debating somewhere in the course of this meeting because that's that's part of of the problem, of course. Now, I, I would like to move to, to the, the question, why, why is it really that? And perhaps the first, the first quick round, why is it really that science is so important in multilateral policy making? Andrea, could you say a few words? Yeah, I, I think for me, because it's foundational and it's evidence-based and it's a way of thinking that enables you to present information in front of someone that actually gives them options because science, you know, it, it's quite funny. People think that once you provide science, this is the answer often. And if you ever talk to scientists and you hear us, we say, well, maybe that could happen. Maybe that could happen. And what you do is you present the information in a way that can be used for policy across a whole array of areas to meet the needs of varying communities. So for me, it's a foundational aspect because if you don't have good science and you haven't at least given the opportunities of policymakers to have the opportunity to hear good science, 
very often they'll come up with something that's really silly, you know, that, that they come up with a, a policy that's designed to deal with a particular problem and it's it doesn't deal with that problem because they actually haven't considered the breadth of science and the options available. Because it, it informs about the complexity of the world, of course. The, the importance of science at the FAO, Ismahan, could you say a few words on that? I, I fully agree with Andrea. Science, it's, it's, it's fundamental. For me, science is discovery, and it's the only tool for us to understand what's happening. If we don't have science, you have no way to explain it, and you would miss on synergies and traits off. So everything in the world interconnect, I mean, be it between different species, be it between different sectors, we divided them that way. But in reality, everything, it's mixed. And unless we have a scientific basis, we can't explain that interconnectedness and we can't correct some misalignment. So uh, so in if you don't use the science and the evidence, as Andrea said, you could make really huge mistakes. I want to just reflect a little bit on subsidies. Like today, you laugh that there is subsidies for sugar, but for the last hundred years, they are the biggest in the world. So it's huge subsidies. You think about subsidies for fertilizer, for example. It was done without really the barriers to say don't overuse it. So there is a lot of policy decisions, be it on trade, be it on support, be it on, on, on different interactions, if they are not based on science, the chances of those policies to make harm is very huge. Within FAO as a technical agency, science is the basis of everything. So as a technical agency of the United Nations, all our, um, our areas of support to the government, and we have four actually, we have policy advisory services, technical advisory services, we have capacity building and knowledge management, those four, all of them, you need science. If you don't have a strong science-based, you can't really fulfill the role of FAO as an organization. And the sugar example is, of course, a very, very sort of immediately understandable. And Sophie, the the role of science in more technical agencies is, is sort of easy to un understand. But if you speak about bringing in NGOs in into the decision making, the international decision making. How how do you see this this interplay specifically between science and well, at the end, giving giving civil society a voice? Well, I, I think similarly, it really provides um, an entry point for civil society because it it provides a common language in a way for for all actors within the multilateral system whether it's member states or un agencies or or civil society to, to come together around an issue you know unpack those issues generates a common understanding common framings about what what are we actually confronted with and that's that's also a way for for civil society to find its its place in terms of um of um of of actions and and, and solutions but it's, you know, civil society also brings a lot of expertise within the, the multilateral system um, as, you know, observer to, to assessment bodies and in many other configuration where a lot of the science community, which is not formally part of member states, actually contribute a lot to, to unpacking what, what we need to, to address. And another dimension is that, you know, science capacity within member states is very uneven. So that science base, you know, shared across um, across the multilateral space really allow also to level to some extent. There are other considerations, of course, but it, it helps level a little bit the, the playing field, the playing field for, for participation uh, across countries, across actors. Thank, thank you. Yeah, Jan Marco, when we spoke earlier. You mentioned this example that in, in many, many areas uh, in the European Union, scientists today are sort of in, in the room or in the decision-making pro process. But for example, in free trade agreements, they are not. Could you develop a little bit on this and why that is a problem or where could be the, the positive impact of scientists? Yes, well, well, let me first say, obviously, the, the European Commission is not a government, it's a public administration. And we are obliged to 
based policies on the best possible evidence. That's why the commission has a very sophisticated science advisory ecosystem with JRC as a science service with 3000 people, with a group of chief science advisors, with technical committees, et cetera, all coming together and providing the evidence. Now, um, the point is when you talk about foreign policies, and I speak here now from my own experience having worked in the European External Action Service, um, you will have, of course, areas where people are used to work with scientists every day. So the diplomats dealing with Arctic issues, for instance, with climate change issues, with oceans, they, they are very used to working with scientists. Um, that's a little bit less so already in some areas like, for instance, health, where, of course, WHO is, of course, dealing with science every day. But the normal diplomat in a foreign ministry, at least before the pandemic, wasn't so much bothered about um, uh, dealing dealing with the scientists, but then when you when the pandemic hit, then suddenly diplomats noticed, uh, okay, you cannot manage a pandemic by just talking to foreign and security policy think tanks. You need to talk to epidemiologists and other experts. And then you have areas in policy where I think we still need to develop this area. And then I mentioned the issue of free trade agreements. So when free trade agreements are being negotiated by, by the trade experts, very often the scientists are not in the room. But why do free trade agreements fail? It's usually because of food safety standards, environmental standards, so very scientific technical issues. And of course, connected also to the values society attaches to, to those issues. Noting myself. Yeah, Marco, th thank you very much. Um, you brought up the the switch that happened with the pandemic. Did this sort of trickle down into other domains than the purely health related ones? Of course, definitely. I mean, the, the pandemic, pandemic has changed a lot. Uh, by the way, also diplomacy itself and the way its diplomacy is done. I mean, if you just think of the tool we are using now, video conferencing, which has impacted, of course, also uh, diplomacy um, with its pros and its con, because you can, uh, on one hand, of course, easily organize international meetings. On the other side, you cannot study the body language of the, of the people on the, on the other person on the other side of the table. Um, but of course, it had also a very uh, practical impact uh, in a way that the, the role of science and technologies, more generally speaking, not just in the health arena, but more generally speaking, became much more important and much more evident. So there was also suddenly the need, actually, how do I engage with science? I mean, how do I identify the right person to talk to? And, and when you talk, for instance, about do I need to close a border or not? because of the pandemic. And that's something foreign policies are responsible for, not health ministries, it's foreign policies. Then of course, they need to interact with uh, epidemiologists, for instance, that can uh, provide advice. Uh, but as we also heard in the, in the discussion this morning, at the end of the day, you need to be clear about the roles and it's not the scientists who take the decisions. Ismail, I, I would like to, to take this argument of the, the pandemic and the switch it has brought a little further and just explore a little bit how how did it change at the UN level because you're also at the um, advisory board of the UN Secretary General how, how how did it change policy making and science interaction in general perhaps related to health issues perhaps even further I think the pandemic taught us all a huge lesson whereby I think we could, we recognize more than ever that we are interconnected, that there are no borders for viruses and, and pathogens. So it brought us a little bit to reality of our interconnectedness. And I think in terms of food security, the impact of the pandemic was horrible. So if we look at the numbers in terms of hungry people, we added 190 million people in the two years where we had the pandemic. And one of the reasons, the main reason for it, it's really the, the measures that were taken by different government to preserve their, their population, and their people. So definitely the pandemic had a huge impact in terms of food insecurity and malnutrition and put us off track on SDG2, but also many other SDGs. It, it's given the situation, we had a huge economic crisis and Given all this re-escalation of, of problems, it brought, up, it brought together more organizations within the UN system. 
whereby if you look at it, um, many of the organization now have chief scientists, which wasn't the case five years ago or six years ago. Uh, there was much more space for science, technology, and innovation in the UN, in the HQ, and there is the forum that has been going on for a few years, but it's getting more and more attention. The Secretary General put several uh, UN special envoys on areas of science. He, he, he gonna be putting one soon on artificial intelligence. He did one on technology and so on and so forth. So there is, I see myself, if I, if I, may, if I may say it this way, there is a snowball that is, has been really building up towards we need more science, we need to accelerate development and hence we need more science and innovation. We need to work more together and to do that, we need really science and evidence to clarify if I do A, what will happen to sector B and so on and so forth. So the UN Secretary General Board Advisory, Scientific Advisory Board, it's, it's uh, both Andrea and myself are a member uh, among few other chief scientists from the UN system. And he has seven independent. It's really a, a group of people to provide really scientific advisory um, areas to services to the Secretary General so that we have a global agenda on the val on using science technology innovation, as I said, to accelerate. We need an acceleration in terms of international development in, in the agriculture sector, in the environment, in the health, in the industrialization, in and in many areas. So how could we really have uh, people like Andrea and myself talk together to find um, certain technologies or certain innovation or certain different approaches and ways of doing it that can both help us in producing more, but with a much more environmental and sustainability basis. So there are many areas that are cross-cutting and they think science is a, is a, is a convener in this case whereby it can bring a different sector together by, because by the end, the same technology is used for human health, for environment and for, for agriculture. So how could we build on each other's strength to use science, technology and innovation the right way to develop better? I would like everybody to gain a little bit of an idea how very practically in your different organizations, how, how very practically it works bringing policymakers and scientists either physically together or somehow in the process. Andrea, could you could you explain us a little bit how, how it works? And it's, it's really on a very practical level. There, there are actually lots of examples as to how this happens. And there are different mechanisms by which scientists and policymakers are brought together. So at a very basic level, we have multilateral environmental agreements, which actually bring together, and most of those MEAs, such as the Minamata Convention on Mercury or the Montreal Protocol or the Convention on Biological Diversity, they all have scientific technical advisors. They have slightly different um, ways of operating, but they actually have the science and, of course, they provide the information and support for member states to help make decisions. We have the International Panel on Climate Change, the International um, Panel on Biodiversity, um, IPES, and, of course, we have a new proposal, which, again, is another um, proposal that has come from member states who, in our case, in UNEP, we have the United Nations Environment Assembly, um, it's 193 member states, and they had a re resolution to say, well, we've got a panel on climate change, we've got a panel on biodiversity, we need one on chemicals, pollution and waste. Those types of panels bring together, re you know, eminent scientists across the globe to actually provide information in policy contexts for member states to take up. And then, of course, there are a range of other fora uh, where you sit around the room with policymakers, and I'm sure there are policymakers today where we're talking about science and policy, where we actually get to engage and talk about what are some of the options for actions to improve building design for heating and cooling so that we reduce energy demand. Um, there are a whole range of discussions, and it's Ismahan said as well, we're working across the UN system as scientists to actually try to join up in a more integrated way to provide better policy advice that considers a range of different decision makers as well. You outlined very early 
finance and trade from our portfolio and environment, we don't talk to trade and finance that often, but absolutely it's something we should be doing to actually enhance the policy making process because maybe it's not an environmental regulation needed, maybe it's actually a different instrument. So I think all of those fora that we have and, and they're multiple and they're in different, um, they, they set up differently can actually inform those discussions. Jan Marco, at, at the level of the European of, of the European Union, how how does it work? Very practically, this bringing together of policy making makers and scientists. Are they meeting in the Bellamont building that is just on the screen behind you, just physically, or how how do you bring them together? Well, of course, I mean there there are uh, a lot of ways. Uh, we have, as I said, an internal science service like JRC where actually the scientists are inside the house and you can share confidential documents with them. That's one of the advantages of having an in-house science service. And they are, of course, connected to the wider scientific community. But at the same time, we have a group of chief science advisors, which are external science advisors. And they are rather providing the science advice on a political level. And they have their advantages of, of course, working widely with the science academies, bringing their um, expertise in and and preparing it in a way that it's digestible so to speak for the for the commissioners and for the elect uh, elected politicians so i think it is very important really to have these people at the interface and it's not just one kind of size fits all it's really the ecosystem that matters because on whatever question or issue one kind of science advice type of science may work better than another one so um, you uh, bring this expertise in, and then it's important that you're inside the organization, you have somebody to talk to. That's why it is so important to have these people that work at the interface that are also trained as interpreters and translators who know how science works, who know how politics and policy making works. Um, and then can, of course, help this, the, the scientific message to bring across, but also the other way around, also to formulate the questions um, from the politicians to the scientific community. Thank you very much. And Sophie, I, I guess at the International Science Council, you don't have the luxury of trained translators who sort of can bring science in digestible packages to, to your audience. Or do you? Actually, we have uh, an international set up an international network for government science advice that Jan Marco knows very well. Um, a, a few years ago, with preci precisely that 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 function to really bring together people that work at the, the science policy interface, practitioner of the interface, to really exchange informally about how you know this interface is shaped in different countries, what makes it work, and 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 share good practices. And I think that's quite important to have also informal spaces like that to be able to to build competence because INSA also delivers some training and they train both scientists to work in policy as well as policy makers and, and advising governments when they want to set up um, their, their own science policy mechanism and, and learn from others which um, sometimes a, a non-governmental entity outside formal processes can also facilitate some of that um, some of that peer exchange another modality um, which is really also about building the demand for scientific evidence because often you also have member, member states that have quite a, a fuzzy idea of what science can actually contribute to their issue um, and we've recently uh, with India, Belgium and South Africa uh, set up a, a group of friends on science for action in the UN General Assembly with the idea of building together a, co a coalition of member states to, to champion science-based evidence-based um, evidence decision-making in uh, the General Assembly, but also create spaces where, where science, scientists, policymakers can also exchange on issues that are on the multilateral agenda, aside from uh, the more formal proceedings. Thank you very much. We we were a little bit at the parts that da, do work, and I would like to move a little bit to the part that doesn't really work. And Sophie, you already brought up this this idea that oftentimes, and there is a fuzzy idea of what science actually could contribute. But I want to explore this a little bit further. What what limits actually the uptake 
of science in the global or, or multilateral context. Isman, could you say a few words on this? I think uh, the major issue, I think, both at the national and the global level, is that there is a, a bit of uh, a power asymmetry in everything. And I find most of the scientists do not have the power for decision making. So most of the time, the policy makers give more priority to other consideration than science. So that's the one, the first issue, I think it's the power asymmetry uh, and it applies at different levels. The second one, I think it's a little bit the uncertainty. So uh, as I think it was mentioned by Andrea, science doesn't give you only one thing. Science gives you, this is what we know. If we research it more, maybe in six months or in a year or in 10 years, depends on what subject are you, are you researching, we can find something different. So scientists are, 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 let's say, trained with that uncertainty. When you talk to the society, to the people, to the policymakers, they don't want to recognize that uncertainty. And most of the time, they want white or black. So that uncertainty that is embedded in science, it's, it's, it makes it sometimes very difficult to push for for certain areas in terms of, of advisory services to the policy makers. There is also sometimes many times insufficient data. Maybe we don't have we don't have enough data really to say, yes, this is the best, um, I don't know, the best varieties or the best animal species or what have you. So there is the uncertainty, the lack of data, the asymmetry in the power. And in many ways, there isn't effective mechanisms to allow us to tackle all of this and to make sure that there is a continuous discussion between scientists and policymakers and the recognition that as we evolve, we could continue that communication and continue that partnership and help really policymakers to take the right decision at the right moment. Because it's also about time, sometimes, particularly in, in certain emergencies, and that's also we have learned it with the COVID, Time sometimes it's it's very crucial and hence you have to play with the real data and you have to act on that basis. Andrea, perhaps for a few more words on what according to you limits the uptake of science in this global arena. Yeah, actually I, I agree with Ismahan about the time factor, but in a different way, in that we don't have 10 years to actually debate some of the environmental policies that we, we want, want to put in place. So if a good science policy interface means you've got science going into the policy process, you're iterating and you're coming back, you're engaging so that you come up with something that is going to be really useful to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. So you need time to do that, but you also need communication skills in being able to translate the science and practically sometimes that's really challenging either there's not enough time in a forum that you might be in and I can think of one actually in recent history where I felt that I had some expertise on a on a topic and there are, there were lawyers foreign affairs people etc they didn't want the intervention from the scientists and that so that was interesting you also have to have a willingness for that two-way engagement uh, within the process and Often, scientists are not in the room. So if you're in the same room, you have more chance of being able to put forward a particular view about something that might inform the discussions. And again, that iterative process of science policy coming back, um, you know, as, as you provide more information, because you are both educating the policymakers, but the policymakers, importantly, are educating you in terms of some of the pragmatics, just because I have some expertise in a particular area doesn't mean I understand the full policy context for a government to make a decision. So it has to be a much more inclusive process that actually joins science and policy makers together and actually getting more of those different disciplines that Ismahan I've been talking about where we integrate some of that for good policy making. And I think now the challenge is more time because the other issue is some of these technologies and developments are so fast, policy can't keep up. So how do we actually address that? Yeah. 
And you're of and course. Olaf, I, Olaf, if I may jump in as, as Andrea was talking, it's also the, the this misalignment in terms of short term versus long term. So whereby most of the policy decision are really short time, whereas the science it's really long term. So this to find a way to communicate it, it's not that it's it's policy always is short term and science is always long term. It's much more an alignment and a better understanding of what's happening and keeping in mind that, for example, for most of the, the environmental targets, most of the intervention we are doing are long term. But then the policymakers need something much more quicker. You talk about agriculture and production same way. So that's that misalignment in terms of time span that the policymakers have in front of them versus uh, scientists or versus technical people. It's different. Absolutely, Jan Marco. Is this is this an issue in European politics and specifically, of course, in bringing in science into European politics? to this sort of misalignment between even, even if the European Commission is rather in administration, but, but still it is bound to the constraints of policymaking, which of course have to give something very quickly to the people, while, as Ismail just said, many, yes. many like environmental rules just take time to implement, to make the ref, their, their effect. Definitely, this is, a, it is, this is an issue, and it's even more acute if you think of international policies and external relations, because every day somewhere in the world there's an earthquake or a coup d'etat or whatever it may be, and the diplomats are kind of running behind these events and uh, don't have the space really to do the long-term thinking, which is something we as scientists are particularly good at. That's why it's so important also to invest in, in foresight. And... Uh, it's also especially important if you think of uh, technologies. Uh, diplomats are increasingly kind of struggling with the speed of technological development and how it impacts on international relations. Um, so it is important really to inform them on what's cooking in the lab, so to speak. And uh, so it's also at the same time, I think we as scientists also need to ask ourselves, you know, how can we raise awareness among scientists that their research may have geopolitical implications, be they positive or negative. So I think that that's something we, are, we also need to invest and, and get the scientists more into this kind of little bit this diplomatic thinking, so to speak. Of course, this also means that you need to get out of your comfort zone. But on the other side, it's the same with the diplomats. They also need to get a little bit out of their comfort zones. And, and we need to bring them together in one room and talk to each other. And Sophia, some, sometimes I, I hear this sort of idea that policymakers have this constraint of, of um, very quick timing, as, as if it was a given that sort of a law of nature. And sometimes I'm wondering, isn't civil society already sort of moving beyond this and understanding that we are on long-term challenges? So I, I guess my question in, in a nutshell is, is, is civil society actually understanding sometimes better, perhaps, the scientific nature of problems than policymakers? Um, I mean, certainly from, from our perspective, um, there, there has been um, a, a real push in looking at sort of more longer term, longer term issues. And I think that's also now um, coming forward in the in the multilateral space with, for example, quite a big emphasis now on future oriented thinking and, and, and foresight uh, around our common agenda that was uh, released by the, the Secretary General uh, last last year. So that's certainly something that. Um, you know, civil society can, can help a lot. And, you know, we can't speak for all civil society. We are one science organization that's non-governmental, but of course, civil society is quite a, um, there's quite a large set of actors. But certainly, I think there is now more appetite in looking at um, longer term, longer term issues um, and really transforming governance, because I think, uh, it's it's interesting to see how you know science has been framed a lot in relation to to technology in the UN space for for a long time, and now um, around our common agenda, it's interesting that it's been framed around governance and how also science can support 
global cooperation and re revitalizing or revamping multilateralism in, in terms of how it addresses intersectionality and, and those short-term, long-term issues that it both need to, to grapple with. You mute it. <laughs> I warned everybody this will happen again and again. I'm doing this all the time. Um, still, Anne Sophie, we moving to to another topic. We when we spoke earlier, you reminded me that yes, the sheer number of stakeholders makes global policy making and specifically specifically the uptake of science in global policy making very complex. But that precisely in that context, science can also be the tool that actually builds the bridges. Could you say a few words on that? Um, yeah, I, th I think that's been quite interesting to see how um, science can, can serve as, as common language. I mean, one example I could take is the work we've been doing with um, United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, which brings together quite a lot of UN agency, FAO, WHO, WMO, UNEP and others um, around uh, a common language around hazards and what risk actually countries need to need to look at and prepare for. Uh, and it's been interesting to, to work on existing international definition and terminology for hazards, but also looking at what countries use in terms of their, their, their statistics and their data collection, and how do we harmonize that so that you know, it builds a common language, a common understand, uh, understanding that then allows you to build early warning system to understand the true impact of disasters um, through that, um, that common aggregation of data that only allow us we, are, we have a, a clear set of different and terminology uh, across the, the issues we're we're looking at. So that's been one example that's been quite useful in in seeing how science can can connect and help harmonize the way we approach those issues. And so he perhaps disconnect and reconnect again. There, there were some sort of weird sounds in the background of, of you, but thank you very much. Just uh, moving moving this metaphor of bridges to to Jan Marco. Um, we spoke also about your, your current role in science diplomacy, which is perhaps less about building bridges, but certainly about maintaining bridges when there have still been or there have been bridges in, in the past. Could you say a few words on that? Um, yes, sure. I think uh, science has always had this potential of crossing borders because the si language of science is universal. Mathematics in China is the same as it is in the United States or elsewhere. And there are plenty of examples, of course, if you look into, into uh, recent history, where science actually has helped kept relations going or re-establishing relations. I mean, take CERN, with, which was the first place where Germany, German and Israeli scientists cooperated after the Holocaust. Uh, or take the fact that even now um, we are still sitting together with Russia on an international space station and are building a, a nuclear fusion reactor together with China, India, Russia, and a couple of other countries. So of course there is this this uh, power of science of of uh, building bridges, but at the same time I think we also need to be aware that there is a reality out there, um, and uh, sometimes and on the science side we just see these these nice uh, things we as uh, scientists can do, and and seem to ignore that of course uh, science diplomacy it is also about restrictive measures, it is about uh, research security, economic security, about foreign interference, and all these more nasty issues. Let's put it this way, and they are basically the backside of the same coin. And I think the real challenge of science diplomacy is how to find the balance between the two, because in any given situation, we you might want to use both the the bridge building function of science as well as the the restrictive measures, for instance. Um, so I think that's that's really the, the challenge we need to we are faced now in this new reality in which we live in. Thank you. Another limitation, uh, Andrea. When we spoke earlier, you you spoke about the fact that sometimes we come with all the the great impact of science to good regulation, and then it fails on the implementation. Could you develop a little on that? Yeah, I think actually that's what we're seeing more and more in that we have many issues for which we do have policies in place and countries have duly put them there. 
but they're not implementing them. And of course, in our portfolio, the environment is still declining. So what does that mean? That means maybe the policy as it was formulated in the first place was not fit for purpose, or it means there are other facets that are influencing implementation of that policy, which means you need to engage with a broader array of decision makers. And so I think this really gets back to how fundamental science is, both in terms of framing how policies might take place, but also then being involved in that process of having a look at the policies and if they're not being implemented, what are the reasons they're not being implemented and how can science actually help you solve that? Now, it may be finance, but it might be a different um, type of action that needs to be taken to resolve a particular issue. And again, where science can help again is in terms of making the data, information and knowledge accessible, transparent and relevant to the people that need to use it. So a given country may not even realise because of the setup that actually they're not implementing their policies and that's why they're experiencing bad air quality or, or whatever else. We have tools now that enable us to have good data information and knowledge that can be made accessible to people. We need to resolve the, the imbalance or inequality in terms of access to um, data and information. And I think, I think the stat is still 53% of those in lower uh, income income countries don't have access to the internet but imagine if we're able to resolve those issues then provide that sort of information then you've got a range of stakeholders who can also hold the governments to account if they're not implementing particular policies or putting in place something different that's going to work thank you very much now i would like to move to something totally else i was asked to debate um, as a sub question here in, in this panel question what needs to be considered when setting up a in new international run um, from, from one to, to the other. We could sort of play a little game here. Let's see if, if it works. Um, it's a little bit of a role game and the overall aim is to explore, of course, what needs to be considered when creating new scientific advice for policy making. Andrea, you alluded already to, to the question of, of artificial intelligence when you um, spoke about the developments that are so fast that we, we don't really have mechanisms for policy making to, to keep the same speed. So I thought we we might take this this topic of artificial intelligence imagine that all of you four you get one superpower and then you get a mission which in a way or another is setting up a new international advisory bo body that deals with the impact of artificial intelligence and the setting around this is the world we're in pretty much ours with all its complexities so you get a superpower and a mission and the missions will be similar Again, setting up this advisory body around regulating or using artificial intelligence and your superpower will be linked to your activities. Let's give it a try. Are we ready? I hope so. And Sophie, starting with you. Your superpower, you have the support of an enormous amount of NGOs and your mission is to set up a new body of scientific advice for global policy global policy makers how to keep the sustainable development goals alive how would you go about within our world with all its complexities so i think also learning from past experience um uh, it's quite important to um no, go from knowledge accumulation to 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 actionable knowledge. Um, so I think um, it's quite important to there's a there's both a need to keep up with the science that's actually developing very fast, but at the same time is making sure that um, the, the digest had the assessment of the state of knowledge um, and exploration of policy option is done in in ways that can really inform decision making. Um, so I think that the multidisciplinary um, input is quite essential, and especially you know if we're talking about artificial intelligence, there's also a lot of dimensions around behavioral sciences, around governance, around regulation um, that's often overlooked. Um, so 
that's for me that would need to be a, a have a big emphasis on on this kind of disciplinary inputs that can really look at um, the human dimensions uh, dimension of that, and then really organizing the the, the interface um, around what what the the needs the needs are, what are the policy questions, what are the decision making context uh, in which the the knowledge that's going to be produced needs to inform. And we know for artificial intelligence that also going to need to to bring in also some some non state actor and private sector perspective potentially in in looking at how the technology is, is changing and how it's it's affecting people. And Sophie, thank you, thank you very much. This is already a massive takeaway from this debate. We have actually an actionable roadmap for setting up a new advisory body. Um, let's turn to Jan Marco. Your superpower, of course, is that you can say, beam me up, Scotty, and you will be beamed up. But also, you spent decades exploring the outer space of European policymaking. And as a creature of fiction, you have a knack for storytelling. And your mission, of course, you might expect this, setting up a scientific advisory body, making sure that Europe's voice is heard internationally, in the debate around artificial intelligence. Jan Marco. <laughs> I think when setting up uh, a new body or advisory body on, on any given tap topic, first of all, you need to have a clear mandate and a mandate to which everybody can agree, which is already quite a feat uh, if you think of the current fragmentation and polarization we see in the world. Second, you need to have clear rules of procedures and processes ensuring, for instance, their transparency. Uh, because the credibility of, of everything will also be, and the buy-in into any advice given will also depend on, on transparency and having the clear procedures in place. You will need a budget, because without budget, of course, you can talk and have a voice, but, but if you want to achieve something, you also need to have a support structure, both in terms of human and financial resources. Um, but then, and that's the, the, the big problem I see, is even if you have such a wonderful uh, institution, advisory institution in place, they will be faced with multilateral organizations that have been invented for a world that doesn't exist anymore. So if you look into UN, often it's still the 1945 reality that is reflected in structures or when China is still being considered as a developing country. Um, um, well, so actually, actually you also need to think of, you know, how need to the, the internet multilateral organization to be adapted actually to be able to take on this advice and, and implement it. Now, there, there was a little bit of a call to reorganize the entire UN system, and we have two representatives of the UN here, of course, but I still would like to keep on. Maybe you can take it into account or not, but let's let's stick to our sort of a li little role game here. Ismahan, your, your superpower would be, let's say you can fly whatever engine you want and the fighter in you never lays down their, their sword and child. And your miss mission, setting up a global council on how to use AI to ending famine once and forever. Isman. Yes, and, perhaps, and perhaps reforming the entire UN system while doing this. I fully agree that the UN has to be reformed. I, I fully agree that with Jan Marco that the setup as it is, it's a 1945 setup that doesn't work anymore. And, and that includes every single part of the UN, including the Security Council, particularly the Security Council, I would say. So in, in if I have an AI to really end hunger, I would really see how could we get more access to knowledge and how could AI understand better the global South and help me to find solutions for the inequalities between the North and the South and because of the huge gap of development and the huge gap in terms of food production and nutrition between the South and the North. So to do that, I think I would make sure that the mandate, I love it, it's wonderful and make sure that I get enough people that knows the South. So the reality is that in most of the places, we don't have enough people from the South talking about the South. And we have people from the North that know very well the South, that have worked in the South, but it's not the same. You don't get to know 
a community you don't get to know everything within a culture by by just doing some research in it. So in my view, having a stronger soil, voices from the South is very important. Uh, blending that with local knowledge. When we talk always about novel things, we, we, we tend to go with that. We're going to restart from scratch, which is completely wrong. I mean, when you think about most of the invention that still existing now come from a local knowledge come from a local knowledge that transform it to something as a gadget on innovation or a vaccine or whatever, and then we are using it. So maybe for me, from my perspective, I would, I would really focus a lot on, on voices from the South, multidisciplinary system approach, many people to think together without that silo. And I would add to that, although I'm talking about AI, I would ask the AI, uh, the AI, be it uh, the, the, the technology holders or the people that can use it, how could we mimic better nature? Because by the end, nature is doing the things far better than whatever we are creating. So how could we, uh, with the AI and the advancement and the voices from the South, mimic nature, but developing, or in my view, producing more with less, producing more nutrition, not just uh, not just quantities, but also quality with less using nature and using the synergies that exist in nature. Isman, wonderful. I think next to your very, very strong call for a stronger voice from the global south, of course, that there was also a call for AI to know its place and to sometimes take a step back and just admit that nature sometimes thinks even or just better. Andrea, your superpower your music speaks directly to people's hearts and has, has the power to overcome quite some resistance. And your mission to set up a scientific body that aims to advise policymakers of this world how to use AI to follow essentially what Greta Thunberg says. Don't listen to me, listen to science. So my If you want to reform the UN structure altogether... By I, doing, I, I don't with, think I'll go. get into reforming use... Uh, UN structures, it will take us too long. So my superpower, which has actually been uh, augmented with new technology in that I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be like data on Star Trek, who develops emotion and who actually very quickly can access data, information and knowledge for wherever it resides, whether it's about a river in a particular location or, you know, a complex analysis that needs to take place. Why? In order to set up a new panel on AI, you're going to have to have access to data, information, knowledge, and it needs to be available across the globe. Because as Ismahan said, if we don't do that, we will continue divide and um, there will be the haves and the have nots and inequality will continue. So if my superpower is the ability to communicate science, then it has to have accessible, transparent, data, information and knowledge to actually share equitably. And I think any work that we do from now on, whether it's about AI or new technologies or whatever, has to embrace these principles so that we do actually allow science to have its voice, but also so that we, we trust it and that we don't use it in the wrong way either. So um, what do they say? I'm going to be a robot called Andrea that will be a, a beneficial dictator? I don't know. Anyway, something along those lines. Thanks. Which leads us back to Aristotle and the Republic of, and, and the leadership of philosophers. Um, but uh, really a, a massive thank you for having played this game and have taken it seriously because there was quite an amount of, of serious advice um, actionably, actually. And I would like to use the last 10, 15 minutes we have, to, I think it's only 10 minutes already, um, to open to questions from the audience. If you have any questions, just write them in the Q&A of this session and we'll take it from there.
see no questions coming in now, but I, I still give it a few a minute or so to see if any questions are submitted. Doesn't appear in mine. Uh, there seems to be one, but it just doesn't appear to me. There might also be some reforming the technical facilities we use. <laughs> we we have quite made we've made quite some advance. Look, I see a. There it is from Barbara Herring. I believe international organizations like the uh, WHO, FAO, WMO, the C are crucial in identifying research needs of policymakers and also to validate research on behalf of policymakers, which is not exactly a question, but never mind. Is anybody among the panelists who wants to say a word on that? I'll, I'll, oh, Ismahan, you have a go, then I'll have a go. <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe just I, as I am, I'm, I, we're waiting for the question, Olaf, I was thinking one of the things as I am, I'm talking and interacting with policymakers that really uh, marked me was one time where oh, in Canada, uh, we invited finally policy ADMs to discuss with science ADMs in a round table of 13 science based agencies and ministries and and the policy uh, and the policy adm said you know guys i think the mismatch is that you don't start with the policy question most of the time the science carries on without really that initial discussion with policy makers on what we are solving as an issue and, and her point really remained with me it's very important to start by a policy question try to solve it through science and bring it back. If we do do that and we we, we create a, a, a feedback loop whereby really we are, we, are, we are doing our science, particularly in the public. I mean, in the private sector, they are doing it very much this way. And that's why the private sector, uh, the, the loop between science and decision, it's working very well. Whereas in the public, we have a bit of a, a misconnect or disconnect between the policy agenda and the science agenda. If we align them, I think we will be in better, in a better world, and in better uh, interconnection and feeding one in another. Thank you very much, Andrea. If you could also take on board the the next question, which 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 is, what would be your advice to have more scientists in the room during deliberative policy discussions within the UN system? Yeah, I'll just respond to the first one from Barbara about uh, identifying research needs. I actually think we are uniquely placed. But also the other thing I've noticed is that often I hear we don't have enough science on that. And I'm going, yes, we do. It's simply that it's not in a form or it's not in a place that people can access it easily in this international forum. So there are two aspects in that when you do undertake some of those reviews and assessments, you certainly identify the gaps very clearly. But there's another issue that I see more often, which is there's a lot of science, but it's not being accessed. And so this is because academics are either publishing in particular journals, they're not available because you've got to pay for them, all those sorts of issues. So there, are, there's some work that I think we need to do there to provide a platform for researchers to place their new research, but also a way of identifying some of those gaps that we see. And I have a list of them actually, through looking at the various bits of work that I do. On the second question, in terms of more science uh, in, in the UN, was that the, the question? Um, exactly. Yeah, more like how, how, to, how to get more science, scientists in the room during the deliberative policy discussions within yeah. the system? I, I think that 
we we need to be communicating with our policymakers and member states just how important it is that we are in the room. And so there is nothing better than being able to sit with a minister while they are discussing a particular point in policy where they're seeking clarification of something that another country has raised or, or whatever. And so one, I would be actually talking to individual member states and then at the UN system where those resolutions are coming forward or particular discussions on topics are being made, is to actually, because member states drive it, they, they are driving a lot of the forum. And, and in many cases, we have to, we're, we're beholden to member states in terms of how they want to run processes. So we need to be able to show the benefit of having scientists in the room, that you're not going to delay it or frustrate it, that you're actually going to improve the discussions and perhaps sharpen them so that you can make better um, decisions at the end. And I have seen it work really well in practice where NGOs, stakeholders and policymakers are actually deliberating was much quicker, much more efficient, but it also relied on a very strong relationship between those individuals, um, which clearly had been built up over a period of time. So perhaps that's a challenge for us to put those types of things in place. There are some good examples. Thank, thank you very much, Ismail. I see that you're raising your, your hand. I just try because time is already running out to take two very quick questions and then we will conclude it. The next question is IPCC and IPBES have, excuse me, have been a success in reviewing and communi communicating the best available science. Are there other similar international panels in discussion? Perhaps a question for everybody, if everybody, anybody has, has an idea if there are similar structures. Yeah. Just, just quickly, there's there's the International Resource Panel and there are discussions on foot at the moment uh, with the open-ended working group on a science policy panel for chemicals, waste and pollution. So those are on foot at the moment. And there is a voluntary one, which is the, uh, the, the name of it is what's come out of the SICAM, which is the Sound Management of Chemicals. There is going to be a new global, and, and apologies for having the name wrong, but it's a new global chemicals framework that is going to kick off soon. There are there are other questions coming in, but I'm just... And maybe, just, Olaf, just yes, quickly, please. there are also two related to agriculture. One of them, um, it's called HLPE, the High Level Panel of Experts, that is connected to the CFS, CFS Committee on Food Security. And there's another one that was just formed last year, which is called SAC, Scientific Advisory Committee, that is part of the UN Food System Summit. So it's much more around food system and advisory, again, scientific advisory services for, for those uh, UN food system. Ismail, perhaps the, the next one and last one we, we will have in the time to take up here, it might be one for you, which is essentially about how to um, open doors for other systems of knowledge, like traditional knowledge. Is this something that plays a role in FAO? Absolutely. And that's really as we put in place the science and innovation strategy, we, we really clarified that it's not talking only about new gadgets, it's not talking about only new technologies, but really embracing local small scale producers knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Most of the time that knowledge, we know the impact, but we don't understand the process. And maybe what we need to do is work with those holders of knowledge to, to try to explain it scientifically to see the different steps. Uh, and I think that's, that's a wealth of knowledge that we are a little bit putting aside right now. And the reason behind is because we don't understand it. It's not well documented in the scientific journals. And it is sometimes also in different languages that we might not have a good understanding of. Thank, thank you very much. And I switch on the um, I, I will not take the last question that is in the chat box. We just, we just have, don't have the time. It's also one of my personal obsessions, which is the storytelling element here. But let's, like for the, the person who has asked this question, let's keep this question um, of, of high importance in all the other debates at this conference. And I would really really like to ask and uh, to 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 thank the entire panel here and a huge applause to everybody.